Chapter Thirteen of Triplanetary. First in the Lensman series by E. E. Doc Smith. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Phil Chenevere. Chapter Thirteen: The Hill. The heavy cruiser Chicago hung motionless in space, thousands of miles distant from the warring fleets of spaceships so viciously attacking and so stubbornly defending Roger's planetoid. In the captain's sanctum, Lyman Cleveland crouched tensely above his ultra cameras. His sensitive fingers touched lightly their micrometric dials. His body was rigid. His face was set and drawn. Only his eyes moved, flashing back and forth between his instruments and the smoothly running strands of steel spring wire upon which were being recorded the frightful scenes of carnage and destruction. Silent and bitterly absorbed, though surrounded by staring officers, whose fervent, almost unconscious cursing was prayerful in its intensity. The visiray expert kept his ultra instruments upon that awful struggle to its dire conclusion. Flawlessly those instruments noted every detail of the destruction of Roger's fleet, of the transformation of the armada of Triplanetary into an unknown fluid, and finally of the dissolution of the gigantic planetoid itself. Then furiously Cleveland drove his beam against the crimsonly opaque obscurity into which the peculiar, viscous stream of substance was disappearing. Time after time he applied his every watt of power with no result. A vast volume of space, roughly ellipsoidal in shape, was closed to him by forces entirely beyond his experience or comprehension. But suddenly, while his rays were still trying to pierce that impenetrable murk, it disappeared instantly and without warning. The illimitable infinity of space once more lay revealed upon his plates and his beams flashed unimpeded through the void. Back to tell us, sir, the Chicago's captain broke the strained silence. I wouldn't say so if I had the say. Cleveland, baffled and frustrated, straightened up and shut off his cameras. We should report back as soon as possible, of course, but there seems to be a lot of wreckage out there yet that we can't photograph in detail at this distance. A close study of it might help us a lot in understanding what they did and how they did it. I'd say that we should get close-ups of whatever is left and do it right away, before it gets scattered all over space, but of course I can't give you orders. You can, though, the captain made surprising answer. My orders are that you are in command of this vessel. In that case, we will proceed at full emergency acceleration to investigate the wreckage, Cleveland replied, and the cruiser, sole survivor of Triplanetary's supposedly invincible force, shot away with every projector delivering its maximum blast. As the scene of the disaster was approached, there was revealed upon the plates a confused mass of debris, a mass whose individual units were apparently moving at random, yet which was as a whole still following the orbit of Roger's planetoid. Space was full of machine parts, structural members, furniture, floatsome of all kinds, and everywhere were the bodies of men. Some were encased in spacesuits, and it was to these that the rescuers turned first, space-hardened veterans though the men of the Chicago were. They did not care even to look at the others. Strangely enough, however, not one of the floating figures spoke or moved, and space-line men were hurriedly sent to investigate. All dead. Quickly, the dread report came back. Been dead a long time. The armor is all stripped off the suits, and all the generators and other apparatus are all shot. Something funny about it, too. None of them seem to have been touched, but the machinery of the suits seems to be about half missing. I've got it all on the reel, sir. Cleveland, his close-up survey of the wreckage finished, turned to the captain. What they've just reported checks up with what I have photographed everywhere. I've got an idea what might have happened, but it's so new that I'll have to have some evidence before I'll believe it myself. You might have them bring in a few of the armored bodies, a couple of those switchboards and panels floating around out there, and half a dozen miscellaneous pieces of junk the nearest things they can get hold of, whatever they happen to be. Then back to Tellus at maximum? 
Right, back to tell us as fast as we can possibly get there. While the Chicago hurtled through space at full power, Cleveland and the ranking officers of the vessel grouped themselves about the salvaged wreckage. Familiar with space wrecks, as were they all, none of them had ever seen anything like the material before them. For every part and instrument was weirdly and meaninglessly disintegrated. There were no breaks, no marks of violence, and yet nothing was intact. Bolt holes stared empty, cores, shielding cases, and needles had disappeared. The vital parts of every instrument hung awry, disorganization reigned rampant and supreme. I never imagined such a mess, the captain said, after a long and silent study of the objects. If you have a theory to cover that, Cleveland, I would like to hear it. I want you to notice something first, the expert replied. But don't look for what's there. Look for what isn't there. Well, the armor is gone. So are the shielding cases, shafts, spindles, the housing and stems. The captain's voice died away as his eyes raced over the collection. Why, everything that was made of wood, baked like copper, aluminum, silver, bronze, or anything but steel, hasn't been touched. And every bit of that is gone. But that doesn't make sense. What does it mean? I don't know. Yet, Cleveland replied slowly. But I'm afraid that there's more and worse. He opened a space suit reverently, revealing the face, a face calm and peaceful, but utterly, sickeningly white. Still reverently, he made a deep incision in the brawny neck, severing the jugular vein, then went on soberly. You never imagined such a thing as white blood, either, but it all checks up. Some way, somehow, every atom of free or combined iron in this whole volume of space was made off with. Huh? How come? And above all, why? From the amazed and staring officers. You know as much as I do, grimly, ponderingly. If it were not for the fact that there are solid asteroids of iron out beyond Mars, I would say that somebody wanted iron badly enough to wipe out the fleet and the planetoid to get it. But anyway, whoever they were, they carried enough power so that our armament didn't bother them at all. They simply took the metal they wanted and went away with it, so fast that I couldn't trace them with an ultra-beam. There's only one thing plain, but that's so plain that it scares me stiff. This whole affair spells intelligence with a capital I, and that intelligence is anything but friendly. I want to put Fred Rodebush at work on this just as fast as I can get him. He stepped over to his ultra-projector and put in a call for Virgil Sams, whose face soon appeared upon his screen. We got it all, Virgil, he reported. It's something extraordinary, bigger, wider, and deeper than any of us dreamed. It may be urgent, too, so I think I had better shoot the stuff in on an ultra-beam and save some time. Fred has a telemagneto recorder that he can synchronize with this outfit easily enough, right? Right. Good work, Lyman. Thanks. Came back terse approval and appreciation, and soon the steel wires were again flashing from reel to reel. This time, however, their varying magnetic charges were so modulating ultra-waves that every detail of that calamitous battle of the void was being screened and recorded in the innermost private laboratory of the Triplanetary Service. Eager though he naturally was to join his fellow scientists, Cleveland was not impatient during the long but uneventful journey back to Earth. There was much to study, many improvements to be made to his comparatively crude first ultra-camera, then, too, there were long conferences with Sams, and particularly with Rodebush, the nuclear physicist, who would have to do much of the work involved in solving the riddles of the energies and weapons of the Nevians. Thus it did not seem long before green Terra grew large beneath the flying sphere of the Chicago. "'Going to have to circle at once, aren't you?' Cleveland asked the chief pilot. He had been watching that officer closely for minutes admiring the delicacy and precision with which the great vessel was being maneuvered preliminary to entering the Earth's atmosphere. Yes, the pilot replied. 
We had to come in in the shortest possible time, and that meant a velocity here that we can't check without a spiral. However, even at that, we saved a lot of time. You can save quite a bit more, though, by having a rocket plane come out to meet us somewhere around fifteen or twenty thousand kilometers, depending upon where you want to land. With their drives, they can match our velocity and still make the drop direct. Guess I'll do that. Thanks. And the operative called his chief, only to learn that his suggestion had already been acted upon. We beat you to it, Lyman, Sams smiled. The Silver Sliver is out there now, looping to match your course, acceleration, and velocity at twenty-two thousand kilometers. You'll be ready to transfer? I'll be ready. And the quartermaster's ex-clerk went to his quarters and packed his dunnage bag. In due time, the long, slender body of the rocket plane came into view, creeping down upon the spaceship from above, and Cleveland bade his friends good-bye. Donning a spacesuit, he stationed himself in the starboard airlock. Its atmosphere was withdrawn, the outer door opened, and he glanced across a bare hundred feet of space at the rocket plane which, keel ports fiercely aflame, was breaking her terrific speed to match the slower pace of the gigantic sphere of war. Shaped like a toothpick, needle-pointed fore and aft, with ultra-stubby wings and vanes, with flush-set rocket ports everywhere, built of a lustrous silvery alloy of noble and almost infusible metals, such was the private speedboat of Triplanetary's head man. The fastest thing known, whether in planetary air, the stratosphere, or the vacuous depth of interplanetary space, her first flashing trial spins had won her the nickname of the Silver Sliver. She had had a more formal name, but that title had long since been buried in departmental files. Lower and lower dropped the speedboat, her rockets flaming ever brighter, until her slender length lay level with the airlock door. Then her blasting discharges subsided to the power necessary to match exactly the Chicago's acceleration. Ready to cut, Chicago. Give me a three-second call snapped the pilot room of the sliver. Ready to cut, the pilot of the Chicago replied. Seconds, three, two, one, cut. At the last word, the power of both vessels was instantly cut off, and everything in them became weightless. In the tiny airlock of the slender plane crouched a space-line man with coiled cable in readiness, but he was not needed. As the flaring exhaust ceased, Cleveland swung out his heavy bag and stepped lightly off into space, and in a right line he floated directly into the open port of the rocket plane. The door clanged shut behind him, and in a matter of moments he stood in the control room of the racer, divested of his armor and shaking hands with his friend and co-laborer, Frederick Rodebush. "'Well, Fritz, what do you know?' Cleveland asked, as soon as greetings had been exchanged. How do the various reports dovetail together? I know that you couldn't tell me anything on the wave, but there's no danger of eavesdroppers here. You can't tell, Rodebush soberly replied. We're just beginning to wake up to the fact that there are a lot of things we don't know anything about. Better wait until we're back at the hill. We have a full set of ultra screens around there now. There's a couple of other good reasons, too. It would be better for both of us to go over the whole thing with Virgil from the ground up, and we can't do any more talking anyway. Our orders are to get back there at maximum, and you know what that means aboard the sliver. Strap yourself solid in that shock absorber there, and here's a pair of earplugs. When the sliver really cuts loose, it means a rough party, all right, Cleveland assented, snapping about his body the heavy spring straps of his deeply cushioned seat but I'm just as anxious to get back to the hill as anybody can be to get me there. All set. Rodebush waved his hand at the pilot, and the purring whisper of the exhausts changed instantly to a deafening, continuous explosion. The men were pressed deeply into their shock-absorbing chairs as the silver sliver spun around her longitudinal axis and darted away from the Chicago with such a tremendous acceleration that the spherical warship seemed to be standing still in space. 
In due time, the calculated midpoint was reached, the slim space plane rolled over again, and mad acceleration now reversed, rushed on toward the Earth, but with constantly diminishing speed. Finally, a measurable atmospheric pressure was encountered, the needle prow dipped downward, and the silver sliver shot forward upon her tiny wings and veins, nose rockets now drumming in staccato thunder. Her metal grew hot, dull red, bright red, yellow, blinding white, but it neither melted nor burned. The pilot's calculations had been sound, and though the limiting point of safety of temperature was reached and steadily held, it was not exceeded. As the density of the air increased, so decreased the velocity of the man-made meteorite. So it was that a dazzling lance of fire sped high over Seattle, lower over Spokane, and hurled itself eastward, a furiously flaming arrow slanting downward in a long, screaming drive toward the heart of the Rockies. As the now rapidly cooling greyhound of the skies passed over the western ridges of the bitter roots, it became apparent that her goal was a vast, flat-topped conical mountain shrouded in violet light, a mountain whose height awed even its stupendous neighbors. While not artificial, the hill had been altered markedly by the engineers who had built into it the headquarters of the Triplanetary Service. Its mile-wide top was a jointless expanse of gray armor steel. The steep, smooth surface of the truncated cone was a continuation of the same immensely thick sheet of metal. No known vehicle could climb that smooth, hard, forbidding slope of steel. No known projectile could mar that armor. No known craft could even approach the hill without detection. Could not approach it at all, in fact, for it was constantly enclosed in a vast hemisphere of lambent violet flame through which neither material substance nor destructive ray could pass. As the silver sliver, crawling along at a bare five hundred miles an hour, approached that transparent, brilliantly violent wall of destruction, a light of the same color filled her control room, and as suddenly went out, flashing on and off again and again. "'Giving us the once-over, eh?' Cleveland asked. "'That's something new, isn't it?' "'Yes, it's a high-powered ultra-wave spy,' Rodebush returned. "'The light is simply a warning which can be carried if desired. It can also carry voice and vision.' "'Like this.' Sam's voice interrupted from a speaker upon the pilot's panel, and his clear-cut face appeared upon the television screen. I don't suppose Fred thought to mention it, but this is one of his inventions of the last few days. We are just trying it out on you. It doesn't mean a thing, though, as far as the sliver is concerned. Come ahead. A circular opening appeared on the wall of force, an opening which disappeared as soon as the plane had darted through it and at the same time her landing cradle rose into the air through a great trap-door. Slowly and gracefully the space plane settled downward into that cushioned embrace. Then cradle and nestled sliver sank from view, and turning smoothly upon mighty trunnions, the plug of armor drove solidly back into its place in the metal pavement of the mountain's lofty summit. The cradle elevator dropped rapidly, coming to rest many levels down in the heart of the hill, and Cleveland and Rodebush leaped lightly out of their transport through her still hot outer walls. A door opened before them, and they found themselves in a large room of unshadowed daylight illumination, the office of the chief of the Triplanetary Service. Calmly efficient executives sat at their desks, concentrating upon problems or at ease according to the demands of the moment. Agents, secretaries, and clerks, men and women, went about their wanted tasks. Televisotypes and recorders flashed busily but silently, each person and machine an integral part of the service which for so many years had been carrying an ever-increasing share of the load of governing the three planets. Right of way, Norma? Rodebush paused before the desk of Virgil Sam's private secretary. She pressed the button, and the door behind her swung wide. 
You two do not need to be announced. The attractive young woman smiled. Go right in. Sam's met them at the door eagerly, shaking hands particularly vigorously with Cleveland. Congratulations on that camera, Lyman, he exclaimed. You did a wonderful piece of work on that. Help yourselves to smokes and sit down. There are a lot of things we want to talk over. Your pictures carried most of the story, but they would have left us pretty much at sea without Costigan's reports. But as it was, Fred here and his crew worked out most of the answers from the dope the two of you got, and what few they haven't got yet they soon will have. Nothing new on Conway? Cleveland was almost afraid to ask the question. No. A shadow came over Sam's face. I'm afraid, but I'm hoping it's only that those creatures, whatever they are, have taken him so far away he can't reach us. They certainly are so far away that we can't reach them, Rodebush volunteered. We can't even get their ultra-wave interference any more. Yes, that's a hopeful sign, Sams went on. I hate to think of Conway Costigan checking out. There, fellows, was a real observer. He was the only man I have ever known who combined the two qualities of the perfect witness. He could actually see everything he looked at, and could report it truly, to the last, least detail. Take all this stuff, for instance, especially their ability to transform iron into a fluid allotrope, and in that form to use its atomic nuclear energy as power, something brand new, and yet he described their converters and projectors so minutely that Fred was able to work out the underlying theory in three days, and to tie it in with our own super ship. My first thought was that we'd have to rebuild it, iron-free, but Fred showed me my error. You found it yourself, of course. It wouldn't do any good to make the ship non-ferrous unless you could so change our blood chemistry that we could get along without hemoglobin, and that would be quite a feat, Cleveland agreed. Then, too, our most vital electrical machinery is built around iron cores. We'd also have to develop a screen for those forces, screens, rather, so powerful that they can't drive anything through them. We've been working along those lines ever since you reported, Rhoda Bush said, and we're beginning to see light. And in that same connection, it's no wonder that we couldn't handle our super ship. We had some good ideas, but they were wrongly applied. However, things look quite promising now. We have transformation of iron all worked out in theory, and as soon as we get a generator going, we can straighten out everything else in short order. And think what that unlimited power means. All the power we want. Power enough even to try out such hitherto purely theoretical possibilities as the neutralization of the inertia of matter. Hold on, protested Sams. You certainly can't do that. Inertia is, must be, a basic attribute of matter, and surely cannot be done away with without destroying the matter itself. Don't start anything like that, Fred. I don't want to lose you and Lyman, too. Don't worry about us, Chief, Rhoda Bush replied with a smile. If you will tell me what matter is, fundamentally, I may agree with you. No? Well, then, don't be surprised at anything that happens. We are going to do a lot of things that nobody on the three planets ever thought of doing before. Thus, for a long time, the argument and discussion went on to be interrupted by the voice of the secretary. Sorry to disturb you, Mr. Sams, but some things have come up that you will have to handle. Nobos is calling from Mars. He has caught the Endymion and has killed about half her crew doing it. Milton has finally reported from Venus after being out of touch for five days. He trailed the Wintons into Thaleron Swamp. They crashed him there, and he won out and has what he went after. And just now I got a flash from Fletcher in the asteroid belt. I think that he has finally traced that dope line, but no boss is on now. What do you want him to do about the Endymion? Tell him to— No, put him on here. I'd better tell him myself. Sam's directed, and his face hardened in ruthless decision— as the horny, misshapen face of the Martian lieutenant appeared upon the screen. Hey, what do you think, Nobos? Shall they come to trial, or not? Not. I don't think so, either. It is better that a few gangsters should disappear in space than that the patrol should have to put down another uprising. See to it. Right. 
The screen darkened, and Sams spoke to his secretary. Put Milton and Fletcher on whenever they come in. He turned to his guests. We've covered the ground quite thoroughly. Goodbye. I wish I could go with you, but I'll be pretty well tied up for the next week or two. Tied up doesn't half express it, Rodebush remarked as the two scientists walked along a corridor toward an elevator. He probably is the busiest man on three planets. As well as the most powerful, Cleveland supplemented. And very few men could use his power as fairly, but he's welcome to it as far as I'm concerned. I'd have the pink fantods for a month if I had to do only once what he's just done. And to him it's just part of a day's work. You mean the Endymion? What else could he do? Nothing. That's the hell of it. It had to be done, since bringing them to trial would mean killing half the people of Marseca. But at the same time it's a ghastly thing to order a job of deliberate, cold-blooded, and illegal murder. You're right, of course, but you would— He broke off, unable to put his thoughts into words. For while inarticulate, manlike, concerning their deepest emotions, in both men were ingrained the code of the organization. Both knew that to every man chosen for it, the service was everything, himself nothing. But enough of that. We'll have plenty of grief of our own right here. Rodebush changed the subject abruptly as they stepped into a vast room, almost filled by the immense bulk of the Boise, the sinister spaceship which, although never flown, had already lined with black so many pages of Triplanetary's roster. She was now, however, the center of a furious activity. Men swarmed over her and through her in the orderly confusion of a fiercely driven but carefully planned program of reconstruction. I hope your dope is right, Fritz, Cleveland called as the two scientists separated to go to their respective laboratories. If it is, we'll make a perfect lady out of this unmanageable man-killer yet. End of chapter 13